Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Turmel, and this is the memorandum for the Medpot Magnificent Seven exemptees in the Supreme Court of Canada, led by Terry Parker, the guy who won the case in 2000, and they were supposed to set up an exemption regime for him, and 12 years later, they seized his pot, and they won't give it back because they say he never qualified under the regime. Well, it was up to them to get his doctor to sign, not up to him, is what we're saying. In the Supreme Court of Canada, on appeal from the Ontario Court of Appeal, between Terence Parker, appellant in appeal, and Her Majesty the Queen, respondent in appeal, applicants memorandum. Overview, <clears throat> one. On November 7th, 2011, Ontario Court of Appeal Justices Rosenberg, Sharp, and Jury Ants heard the appeals by six medical marijuana exemptees charged with various prohibition offenses before and after establishing their medical need, and by the Terry Parker, whose 2000 Ontario Court of Appeal decision established his medical need and who is now seeking the return of marijuana seized by Canada Post. The Medpot Magnificent Seven appellants were C-51-187 Terrence Parker, not marijuana, MMAR exempt, seeking the return of marijuana seized by Canada Post in 2006 under Section 24 of the CDSA, 2. C-52007 Gary Pallister, charged, but then became exempted, seeking an order citing the Crown for contempt of Svetkopoulos and Barron decisions and expunging all bogus convictions while the MMAR exemption was defective and possession and production offenses of no force and effect. 3. C-53096, Deborah McIntyre, charged but then became exempted, seeking an order citing the Crown for contempt and expunging all bogus convictions while the MMAR was defective. Four, uh, C-52961, Mark McDonald, charged, then became exempted, with charges stayed by the Crown, and he's seeking an order citing the Crown for contempt and to expunge the bogus convictions while the MMAR exemption was defective. Five, C-52549, Rob McCready, charged, but then became exempted, and appealing conviction for possession under Section 4.1. C-52898, Court of Appeal number, Wayne Hearn, charged and but then became exempted and appealed conviction for production, cultivation, under Section 7-1. And 7, Sean Maloney, charged but then became exempted and appealed conviction for possession for the purpose of trafficking, under Section 5-2, and a 30-day jail sentence to be served on weekends. First offense. 3. The Crown noted the challenges to the CDSA marijuana offenses were based on arguments promulgated by, yours truly, John Termel, that had been dismissed over the years. Despite Crown opposition, the court nevertheless allowed John Termel to help the appellants argue those Termel arguments. 1. Bino. The JP decision ruled, bad exemption is no offense. 2. Polkoa. Parliament only legislates. Courts only abrogate. Three, Hitzig 170, paragraph 170 of the Hitzig decision, established medical need to simply be exempt. So sick guys are automatically exempt when they can prove they needed it. Four, no doctor. Health Canada has not yet persuaded Parker's Doctors Association to participate in the MMAR exemption regime. Guess it didn't work, did it? Four. On December 22, 2011, the Court of Appeal dismissed all the appeals. Ruling! And five. The Parker reasons. Now, they had three decisions. The Parker decision, and then the other six, they heard together, but they stuck Maloney off separately because he had to deal with his jail sentence. So five and one. But I'm dealing them all together here. But from the Parker reasons, 
Paragraph 1. This appeal involves the dismissal of an application for return of seized marijuana pursuant to Section 24 of the CDSA. The appellant's Section 24 application was originally dismissed on December 7, 27 by Clements J. of the Ontario Court of Justice. The appellant appealed Clements J.'s decision in the Superior Court of Justice. Tullock J. ruled that he had jurisdiction under Section 40 of the Courts of Justice Act to hear the appeal. He subsequently dismissed the appeal on September 30th, 2009, and the appellant now appeals from the decision of Justice Tullock. That's Terry Parker. Six, from the Maloney decision, paragraph one. On May 27, 2011, the appellant, Maloney, pleaded guilty to one count of possession of marijuana for the purpose of trafficking. Bordolo J. sentenced the appellant to 30 days imprisonment to be served intermittently and 11 months probation. The appellant initially appealed his conviction. At the hearing of that appeal, with the consent of the Crown, time to appeal sentence was extended. So, and finally, seven, the McCready reasons, and this is the big decision with all of the major arguments in, in them. One, these appeals involve five, and count the six with Maloney, appellants who've been charged, and in some cases convicted of marijuana-related offenses contrary to the CDSA. The appellants have been frustrated by the operation of the Marijuana Medical Access Regulations, MMAR, and argue that the offenses with which they've been charged have been judicially repealed. The reasons in this appeal are being released at the same time as the reasons in the companion cases of Parker and Maloney. Eight, <clears throat> paragraph two. The appellants McCready and Hearn appeal from convictions for marijuana-related offenses. The appellant McCready was convicted of possession of marijuana contrary to Section 41 by Lalonde J. of the Ontario Court of Justice on July 19, 2010. Appellant was charged on February 20, 29, four months after having sent in his doctor's signed MMAR application. Justice Lalonde ruled there would be no prosecution had there been no six-month delay. So, 10. The court continued, paragraph 2. The appellant Hearn pleaded guilty to production of marijuana contrary to Section 7 of the CDSA in the Court of Justice on July 9th, 2010. And we answer, uh, no, they continue. The appellants Pallister, McIntyre currently face charges for production and possession for the purpose of trafficking and production and simple possession, respectively. The appellant McDonald was charged with possession for the purpose of trafficking in December the 8th. <clears throat> Those charges were stayed in December 2010. Pallister, McIntyre, McDonald each seek to have the Crown cited for contempt for continuing to prosecute marijuana offenses. Finally, they seek to expunge the criminal records of all people convicted of marijuana offenses. 11. They continue. So, the appellants McCready and Hearn appeal their convictions. They raise the following issues. 1. The court says, though charges should have been quashed as marijuana is no longer a controlled substance. One argument they made. 2. Their charges should have been judicially stayed as marijuana is no longer should be a controlled substance. And uh, their charge should have been dismissed was the third ground relying on having established medical need by obtaining exemptions to simply be exempt pursuant to Hitzig paragraph 170. 13. Uh, their par court paragraph 11. The appellants raised the following issues respecting marijuana offenses. The combined effect of the decisions of the Ontario Court of Appeal in R versus Parker, Hitzig, and R versus JP is the repeal of the marijuana prohibitions. This deemed repeal has never been remedied. Two, the decision in R versus Krieger is deemed to have repealed the marijuana production offense in Section 7 of the CDSA. And three, the decisions in Svetkopoulos and Barron have an invalidated marijuana prohibition retroactive to at least December 3rd, 2003. And we call that Bino 2, the second period. Paragraph 14, I point out the court failed to note for reliance on Hitzig paragraph 170 after having established medical need to simply be exempt. So they keep ducking that point. All right, questions and issue from the McGrady reasons. A, whether the court erred in ruling its amendments in the MMAR revived the prohibitions in the CDSA when Section 43A of the Interpretation Act states, where an enactment is repealed in whole or in part, 
the MMAR. The repeal does not revive any enactment or anything not enforced or existing at the time in the CDSA when the repeal takes effect, or whether Parliament only legislates new penal sanctions and courts only abrogate. Paul Coa. 16. B. Question. Whether Krieger decision in validating the Section 7.1 uh, offense took effect on March 18, 2003, and C, whether the JP Bino bad exemption means no offense decision quashing the possession charge when the Parker Declaration of Invalidity of the Section 4 possession offense was in effect while the MMAR were found to be defective between August 1st and October 7th by the Hidsig Court should apply again now that the Baron Court has ruled the MMAR have been flawed by the same very two defects between December 3rd, 2003 and March 4th, 2010. D. Whether the court erred in finding the Parker and Krieger invalidations do not apply to McCready's Section 4.1 possession offense, nor Hearn's production offense, because they do not apply to Termel's possession for the purpose of trafficking offense under Section 5.2. That's what they said. Termel didn't beat 5.2, so you can't beat 4 and 7. 19. E. Whether the MMAR was constitutional during the suspension of the Barron decision, striking down both MMAR flaws when the appellants were charged. F. Whether other non-Ontario courts not following JP is reason for Ontario courts not to follow JP, as Taliano J. in the Murnock case did. G. Whether the Svetkopoulos, Barron, Murnock decisions are sufficient evidence in appellant's challenge to the MMAR. And 22H. Whether the court should have waited for the Murnock decision before dismissing the appeals, because Taliano J.'s Bino ruling in Murnock has been merely stayed. I. Whether the presumption of trafficking by Maloney, to whom Health Canada has now granted an exemption, sustainable, given the more likely presumption of bulk buying for established medical need. Did he have a pound because he wanted to traffic, or did he have a pound because it helped fill this two-pound prescription? Whether bogus convictions while the MMAR was deficient should be expunged, important question. And K, whether obtaining MMAR exemptions, establishing applicants' medical need to simply be exempt pursuant to Hitzing paragraph 170 should have been considered, and they ducked that point. Now the Parker reasons. Whether the Superior Court criminal order of Pitt J could be set aside in Superior Civil Court Justice Chapnick as a default judgment. M, whether Carol Bouchard's affidavit citing 431 doctors from Ontario's 227,000 doctors is evidence of Parker's claim of one in 60 doctors in Ontario. And whether asking his family doctor and not seeking a new doctor was too minimal an effort. And, oh, whether Health Canada's failure to enlist Parker's doctor to participate in the MMAR is a failure to comply with the order of the court by Terry Parker in the August 1st, 2001. Did he have to convince his doctor or did Health Canada have to convince his doctor? And P, whether the death of 18,000 epileptics at a rate of four fatal seizures per day from Canada's known epileptic population of 400,000 is of sufficient importance for leave to be granted. Arguments, part three. A, Polkoa, Parliament only legislates, courts only abrogate. Paragraph 31. Courts, paragraph 14. Rather, this court brought the MMAR into compliance with the Charter by striking down Section 41B, which prohibited a licensed producer for growing for more than one authorized to possess holder, and Section 54, which prohibited more than three licensed producers from producing in common. 15. Hitzig created a retrospective period of invalidity of the prohibition of marijuana possession dating back to July 31, 2001, the date that the suspension of invalidity in Parker 2000 ran out. Going forward, 
Hitzig made the prohibition of marijuana possession fully constitutional in Ontario as of October 7, 2003, the date of the Hitzig decision. Now, I say since Parliament has never reacted reenacted those offenses after they were declared of no force in Parker and Krieger, and the Interpretation Act states, for the purposes of this Act, an amendment that has been replaced is repealed, and an amendment that has expired, lapsed, or otherwise ceased to have an effect is deemed to have been repealed. Section 43A, where an enactment is repealed in whole or in part, the repeal does not revive any enactment or anything not in force or existing at the time when the repeal takes effect. So, 33, I said, the court's amendments to the MMAR could not revive the invalid possession and production offenses under Section 4 and 7 of the CDSA that were not in force at the time. It takes Parliament to reenact those prohibitions. B. Krieger took effect March 18, 2003. Uh, they, the court wrote paragraph 34, Krieger does not assist the appellants. And 19, in Krieger, the Alberta Court of Appeal of Queen's Bench, no, the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench held that because Mr. Krieger used marijuana to alleviate his suffering from multiple sclerosis, the production prohibition in Section 7 of the CDSA infringes Section 7 Charter rights to liberty and security of the person. The court held that Section 7 was of no force and effect with respect to marijuana production. The Declaration of Invalidity was suspended for one year to give the government time to arrange for a legal source of marijuana for therapeutic use. The Alberta Court of Appeal extended the suspension of the declaration, quote, until further order of the court, unquote. That suspension has never been lifted. In the interim, the Hitzig line of cases resulted in the NMAR which would allow for lawful access to marijuana for therapeutic use. The constitutional defect identified in Krieger was thereby remedied during the period of suspension, and the declaration of invalidity is now moot. 35. My answer is the interim suspension could not be lifted from a closed file because it lapsed with the further final order rendering the court functus officio on March 18, 2003. And the constitutional defect identified was not remedied in Hitzig until later, on October 7, 2003, after the act and suspension ran out on March 18, 2003. It was not remedied during the suspension. How can the courts get their dates wrong? 36. On June 18, 2003, after both the Parker and Krieger Court's invalidations had taken effect and before the Hitzig decision on October 7 rendered the MMAR constitutional again, Real Martin was charged with Section 4.1 possession and Section 7.1 cultivation, production, and he had no medical need. So in 2005, Real Martin's Section 4 possession charge was withdrawn due to Parker, but his Section 7-1 production charge was not withdrawn due to Krieger. They said only in Alberta. Anyway, despite his possession charge being dropped while there was a bad MMAR exemption, his motion to similarly quash his production charge while there was a bad exemption was dismissed. November 19, 2010, the Ontario Court of Appeal dismissed Real Martin's appeal against his Section 7-1 cultivation charge uh, being dropped due to Krieger, like his Section 4-1 possession charge had been dropped due to Parker because he wasn't sick, they said. All Medpot Magnificent 7 appellants have established medical need here in charge with the Section 7-1 offense. Like Parker and Krieger, had, even though Martin had not established medical need. So, would have applied to Martin, except he wasn't sick. Well, now they're saying, we are, should apply to us. And the court said, no, it doesn't. C, if Parker hits a Bino, why not Parker Baron Bino? 38. In their paragraph 28, they write, these appeals are some of many cases that have recently found their way to this court, either as conviction appeals or attempts at prerogative remedies many cases. 
They all turn on an argument referred to by the appellants as Bino, bad exemption equal no offense. By the reasons in this appeal and the companion appeal in Parker, it should now be apparent that this argument cannot succeed. This court and other courts have dealt with the so-called bad exemption by reading words in to fix the constitutional infirmity or by striking down the exemption. It was only in Hitzig that the effect of the bad exemption was to retroactively render of no force and effect the Section 4 CDSA possession prohibition as it related to marijuana. That order gave effect to the order with this court in Parker. In Parker 2000, this court gave Parliament a year to fix the problem. The effect of Hitzig was to find that Parliament had not succeeded. Hence, the order in Parker declaring Section 4 of no force and effect took effect, but only until October 7, 2003. Put another way, the Beano argument bad exemption, no offense, only applied to the period from July 31st to October 7th, the first be no period. Now, I say, on a December the 8th, with no distinction as to medical need, the Crown dropped the remaining 4,000 possession charges across Canada since Terry Parker Day, August 1st, 2001, to October 7th, 2003, it's a date in compliance with the Parker Hitzig rationale from JP. But the Crown did not expunge the 100,000 bogus convictions registered while there was a bad exemption and no offense for those two years. All those convicted people still got their bogus criminal records. And the Crown did not drop any remaining cultivation charges at all in compliance with the Krieger Hitzig rationale nor expunge any bogus convictions under Section 7. 40. Third paragraph 16. Following Hitzig, a new provision was added to Part 4 of the NMAR, which enabled the government's supply of dried marijuana to be shipped directly to persons authorized to possess. Sections 41B and 54 reenacted in their original form as Sections 41B1 and 54.1. As we explain in Parker, the fact that the government reenacted sections 41B and 54 when it revised the MMAR in response to Hitzig did not retroactively resurrect the effect of the Parker 2000 decision striking down the prohibition. So, when there was a bad exemption for the first two years, it worked, JP logic. But when there's a bad exemption the second time around, it doesn't work anymore. They're not going to explain to us. Parker reasons. The declaration of invalidity in Parker does not survive indefinitely, waiting to be invoked whenever problems are identified with the constitutional validity of a provision of the MMAR. Oh, really? Well, that's what, not what JP said. A finding of invalidity would be depend on a fresh finding of invalidity with respect to the marijuana offenses of the CDSA. So I wrote, the JP decision did not rule there was no offense absent a constitutionally adequate medical exemption once. Okay, JP ruled there was no offense absent a constitutionally adequate medical exemption. And it didn't say once. And then when they screw it up again, it won't work no more. They just said it doesn't work if they don't have an exemption working. Bad exemption means no offense, and not bad exemption means no offense only the first time, which they say it does. <laughs> 43 McCready reasons, paragraph 20. Svetkopoulos was a civil application for declaratory relief in the federal court. Strayer J. found that the NMAR still did not adequately address the issue of lawful supply first canvassed in Hitzig. In other words, Hitzig found this limit on growers, I mean, patients to grower was unconstitutional, and he now found the same thing. He declared Section 41B1 of the MMAR, which prohibited the whole river production license from growing for more than one, invalid. He did not, however, strike down any of the prohibitions in the CDSA. Well, he couldn't. He didn't have anybody charged in front of him like J.P. And besides, Alan Young didn't ask. Oh, I'd probably say that. So, 44, I now say... <clears throat> 
Crown Attorney Sean Godet argued to the Supreme Court in Spetkopoulos Memorandum, paragraph 33, quote, the court in R versus JP ruled that the combined effect of Parker and Hitzig meant there was no constitutionally valid marijuana possession offense between July 31st, 2001 and October 7th, 2003. The date the marijuana were cut, were, the MMAR were constitutionally rectified by the decision in Hitzig. Courts may construe the Federal Court of Appeals decision in Svetkopoulos as creating a similar period of retrospective invalidity dating back to December 3rd, 2003, the date that Section 41B1 and 54 was reintroduced into the MMAR until March the 4th, 2010, when the Barron decision finally knocked out that last bad limit. Paragraph 45, uh, third 21, R versus Barron involved the prosecution for production and trafficking in marijuana. Konigsberg J of the British Court, uh, Columbia Supreme Court relied on Spetkopoulos and held that Section 41B1 and 54.1 of the MMAR infringed Section 7 Charter. No provision of the CDSA was found to be invalid in Barron. So I now say... 46. The courts weren't asked to construe the bad exemption declared in Svetkopoulos and Barron meant no offense. In both instances, there was no companion charge like there had been when the JP appeal asked for no offense, when Hitzing declared a bad exemption. These applicants are now asking if the JP decision that a bad exemption means no offense resulted in JP's quash charge during the first be no bad exemption, the courts should construe the Barron decision, creating another period of retrospective invalidity dating back to December 3rd, 2003, the date that Section 41 and 54 were reintroduced back into the MMAR, to March 4th, 2011, the date the MMAR were constitutionally rectified by the decision in Barron. D. Parker Krieger applied to McCready and Hearn. 47. Third paragraph 22 court said the appellants argue that by analogy to Hitzig and JP, Svetkopoulos and Barron have the effect of invalidating all marijuana offenses retroactively dating back to December the 3rd. This argument fails for several reasons. First, Hitzig and JP only affected the constitutionality of the offense of simple possession of marijuana, not the offense of production for the or for the purpose of trafficking. The foundational declaration of the invalidity in Parker simply declares that the reference to marijuana in Schedule 2 is of no force and effect for the purpose of the possession charge in Section 4 of the CDSA. The declaration does not extend to any other section of the CDSA, Termel 2003 at paragraph 6. Thus, if the appellant's argument had merit, it could only apply to the simple possession charges against the appellants McCrady, Pallister, McIntyre. And we say appellant McGrady was convicted only under section 4.1 and not 5.2 for the purpose of trafficking. So 49, paragraph 17, they continue. The appellants argue that in combination, Parker, Hitzig, and JP have the effect of completely repealing all of the marijuana offenses set out in the CDSA. No, we answered not all, just possession. Termel argued all, that was rejected. Parker argued possession, that was accepted. They continued, that is incorrect, all, right? In R versus Termel, see, they're knocking the all again. So yeah, the declaration does not extend to any other section of the CDSA. In particular, it does not diminish the effect of listing of marijuana in Schedule 2 for the purposes of Section 5.2 of the CDSA. 52. So we say Parker and Krieger invalidations do apply to McGrady's Section 4.1 possession offense nor Hearns do production offense, even if they do not apply to Termel Section 5.2, purpose of trafficking offense. Okay. No appellant is arguing the Parker or Krieger declaration applies to Section 5.2, purpose of trafficking offense, once Termel did and lost. Only Sean Maloney is now challenging his purpose of trafficking one pound upon the new ground that possession of less than his current exemption must be presumed to be bulk buying and not for trafficking. No other applicant is arguing that all prohibitions have been invalidated by Parker and Krieger. Only possession and production. E. Whether MMA are constitutional during Barron suspension. 
53, the court, paragraph 24, wrote, Second, the period of retroactive invalidity that the appellants argue for would not apply to any of them. A, retroactive invalidity would only work backward from the date of Svetkopoulos. The offense dates in the cases of McDonald, McGrady, Hearn, <coughs> December 8, 208, February 209, April 209, respectively, are after January 10, 208, when the Svetkopoulos Declaration remedied the Svetkopoulos problem. The offense dates in the cases of Pallister and McIntyre, October 2, 2009, January 7, 2010, are after paragraph 41 of the MMR was amended in response to Svetkopoulos on May 14. No court has found the amended regulation unconstitutional. Third, the offense dates in the cases of McGrady, Hearn, Pallister, McIntyre are during the one-year barren suspension of invalidity, which began on February 2nd, 2009. So, Maloney's offense date, June 6, 2010, is after the MMAR were amended in response to Barron on March 11, 2010. So we say applicants claim retrospective invalidity backward from the date of the Baron ruling, fixing both section 41 and 54 defects, and not backward from the earlier Svetkopoulos, fixing only the first flaw. Being charged during the suspension before the Baron decision took effect to fix the problem means it does help all those charged while there was a bad exemption which had, which had not yet been fixed by Baron. Imagine them getting that wrong. We were charged during the suspension before Barron fixed it. And they go, you're guilty because you were charged during the suspension when it didn't apply. Duh. Anyway, F, whether or not Ontario courts not following JP matters. 55, 26, paragraph 4, although the trial judge in Barron declared sections 41B and 54, one of the MMR invalid, she made findings of guilt under the CDSA. Thus, Barron upheld the production and trafficking offenses as they relate to persons who do not have ATPs under the MMAR. So we said, though many have found a bad exemption and not followed JP to declare no offense, they weren't asked and weren't in Ontario, subject to the Ontario Court of Appeals JP ruling. These applicants are all in Ontario and would expect to be treated according to JP's treatment. G, whether Svetkopoulos Baron Myrna sufficient evidence. The charges against McGrady and Hearn not to be stayed. 27, the court said, the appellants McGrady and Hearn submit that the charges against them should be stayed as marijuana no longer should be a controlled substance. The record does not support this position. No evidence. The appellants submit a list of 25 complaints related to the MMAR. The complaints are not grounded in evidence in the record placed before the trial courts or this court. We'll see. Insofar as complaints reference Svetkopoulos and Barron, the appellant's argument is addressed above, Ooh, where they said, we're not going to deal with that. All right. Mm. And if they wish to now challenge the validity of any part of the CDSA or the MMAR, they can do so as part of the defense to their charges or by an application in the Superior Court of Justice. However, that defense in any application must be based upon proper material that clearly demonstrates the constitutional infirmity of the MMAR and the link between the CDSA offenses and the alleged infirmity in the MMAR. So we answer, appellants did adopt the same arguments as in Barron in relation to the imposition of the old limits plus one. Because a week after they struck down the limit of three growers per patch, Health Canada put back a new limit. Four said that's so much better. Now that's constitutional. Three wasn't, but four is. They're laughing at the courts, and the courts deserve it. Anyway, um, so the appellants did adopt the same arguments as in Barron in relation to the imposition being just as uneconomically unconstitutional as the old limits and adopted the arguments in Myrna with respect to the lack of doctors, which won and is being appealed. H. Dismissed before Myrna Abino decision. Court wrote paragraph 27. The appellants also make reference to the trial decision in Myrna 
In that case, Taliano J. declared that the prohibitions against possession and production of marijuana in sections 4 and 7 of the CDSA are invalid. However, this court has already extended the Murna suspension of invalidity pending appeal. Doesn't mean we lose, just means that they haven't decided yet, so they're going to make us lose right now. Before it's decided, we might have won. 29, it continues since October 7, 2003, with the exemption of the 2011 decision in Myrna. No court has held that the MMAR marijuana, I'm sorry, the marijuana prohibitions are invalid. The order made by Taliano J. in Myrna, holding the possession and production of marijuana offenses of the CDSA and the MMAR to be of no force and effect, cannot assist the appellants at this point because that order has been stayed. And think about it. If it comes down later that they win, that means these guys have been convicted when they should have won. Maybe they should have waited. 16. Judge Taliano is the first to follow the J.P. Bino decision. Finding a bad exemption means no offense for Myrna. And the court should have waited to see if the appeal of Myrna is dismissed to the benefit of the appellants. I. Whether medical need presumes bulk buying, not trafficking. Appellant Maloney was convicted for possession for the purpose of trafficking one pound, and he's now exempted to possess even more. An exemptee who has established medical need should be presumed to have possessed his medicine for the economic purpose of bulk buying and not trafficking. J. Must bogus convictions be expunged? Well, because the last 4,000 remaining possession charges from the Parker Hitzig Bino period, declared in AJP, were withdrawn by the Crown on December 8, 2003, the court erred in not expunging the 100,000 bogus convictions for possession registered while the MMAR were deficient. They're letting all those people keep their criminal records unfairly. As well as the convictions registered during the next Parker Baron Bino period when the MMAR were deficient. K. Hitzig 170 not considered. In claiming to have revived the CDSA prohibitions by their amendments in the MMAR, in paragraph 170, the Hitzig court added those charged need only, quote, established medical need to simply be exempt, like Parker, Krieger, Myrna, GP have done. 64. On December 15, 2004, though Health Canada had rejected his doctor's application for medical use, Quebec Court Justice Pierre Chevalier stayed the charges in R versus Johnny Dupree after he entered his medical file and doctor's testimony and evidence to establish medical need. And the judge reasoned Dupree was simply exempt with no reason to doubt he was not also in need when he was charged. Despite not establishing medical need to the satisfaction of Health Canada, he established medical need to the satisfaction of the court to simply be exempt. L. Parker, pit exemption, extension. On March 15, 2002, Pitt J. of the Superior Court of Justice ordered that the constitutional exemption granted to the appellant following Parker 2000 be extended until such time as the government's comply with the court's ruling. The appellant argues that this order entitles him to lawfully possess marijuana. However, Chapnick J. set aside Pitt J.'s order on April 19th. The appellant appealed Chapnick J.'s decision, and this court found that she made no error when she set aside the order of Pitt J. Thus, the March 15th order of Pitt is no assistance to the appellant. And I said, yes, the Court of Appeal did rule that civil court could set aside a criminal ruling as a default judgment. It didn't make it right. M. Insufficient evidence of lack of 160 doctors. Paragraph 33. The appellant asserts that only one in 60 Ontario doctors participate in the medical marijuana regime, making the possibility of obtaining an exemption under the MMAR illusory. Clements J. dismissed Parker's argument on the grounds that there was no evidentiary record before him to support the appellant's claim. 34. No court can determine whether or not this argument has merit in the absence of relevant information. 
Clemens J. was correct to refuse to consider the appellant's constitutional challenge in the absence of a proper evidentiary record. We note that this issue was decided by Taliano J. in R. versus Myrna on an extensive factual record, but his order has been stayed pending appeal. So I argued the court failed to note that in the affidavit of Health Canada's Carol Bouchard, paragraph 8, January 16, 2007, Appeal Book, Volume 1, Tab 13, says, quote, As of 2003, November, uh, 2006, November 3rd, 705, 1603 persons in Ontario, Canada, have an authorization to possess marijuana for medical purposes, supported by 431 practitioners. So, the Ontario College of Physicians has 27,128 licensed doctors in 2007. 27,128 divided by 431 is 62.9. One in 63 doctors were signing when Terry Parker was supposedly supposed to go out there and find a doctor. So now, and Judge Taliano condemned the lack of doctors in Myrna, even though there are now more doctors. And minimal efforts to seek new doctor. Paragraph 13, the court said, Parker had made minimal efforts to comply with the NMAR. He refused to seek a doctor to sign his ATP application. Whoa, whoa, Parker had asked his family doctor not to minimal an effort to comply. And he refused to seek a new doctor to sign his ATP. Big difference. When Health Canada could not persuade his family doctor to participate in the MMAR, asking Parker to seek a new doctor with only 431 out of 20,000 participating, one in 63, made the search unconscionably onerous. Oh, failure to enlist Parker's doctor. The 2000 Parker decision ordered Health Canada to set up an MMAR regime to exempt Terence Parker. After 12 years, his doctor's professional association has still not endorsed Health Canada's MMAR regime. So how can it be said that the MMAR have complied with the Parker court's order when Parker ends up not exempted? Failure to set up a regime acceptable in the medical community is no more evident than in the fact the poster boy for medical marijuana movement still isn't exempted. 15,000 dead epileptics since the regime P at a rate of four fatal seizures per day from Canada's known epileptic population of 400,000. 18,000 epileptic deaths due to faulty exemption regime ordered set up by the Parker Court is of sufficient importance for leave to appeal to be granted. So, part four, costs. Applicant seeks no order as to costs, and he seeks an order granting leave to appeal, dated at Toronto, March 22nd, 2012. 